Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tweedle Podcast. Um, we are back with an episode that was actually recorded in November of 2021 with myself and Rob. Um, we actually set out to record and put out this podcast all that many years ago and uh, God knows how time's flown. But anyway, we recorded a podcast back then. It was actually our first ever podcast with um, a really cool guest. And so we thought, Do you know what? We don't want to waste this one. We're going to release it anyway. There is sadly no video with it. It's just audio, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it nonetheless. Um, and yeah, if there's a bit of outdated chat, that's why we recorded it in 2021. So there's a few things happened since then. Um, and yeah, without further ado, our guest today made his debut for Leinster Rugby in 2008. He played for Irish Rugby for over 10 years, gaining himself 56 caps. Uh, he's toured with the British and Irish Lions twice. Arguably has the best uh, try ever made in, in British and Irish rugby. Lions rugby, sorry. Um, and yeah, open side flanker legend. He's now retired from rugby and uh, he's back uh, coaching for Leinster in the team there. And he's also become a father. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Mr. Sean O'Brien. Very good. Well, um, we're going to obviously cover more and more about EJ Churchill and about Tweedle and about ourselves yeah. and our backgrounds in episodes to come. But actually on this episode, we have um, none other than Mr. Sean O'Brien, who, um, for those that don't know, is an Irish rugby legend. Um, Steady on. Still playing for, Lon uh, for London Irish here in London. Well, when he's not um, injured. When he's not injured. And uh, yeah, covered two Lions tours, no less. And... Um, is into a bit of shooting now, so without further ado, I think we should introduce our first guest of our podcast, Rob. Straight off the straight off the rugby field. Straight off the rugby field this morning, and uh, extremely late notice. Sean O'Brien, how are you? I'm great, lads. I'm great. A little bit sweaty and uh, wonder... panicky still after after training because I was dashing here as Rob didn't organise this properly. But anyway, <laughs> we're here. We're here now. I nearly didn't make it myself, so don't worry about it, mate. Yeah. You've been sitting here on your own, Sam. Oh, mate, I was, I've literally twiddled my thumbs while I was waiting, but there you go. Um, <laughs> You've got Fred, Sam. We're here, You're mate. both here. I appreciate don't, it. Don't worry. And, Thank um, you, Sean. That's really... Above and beyond. Yeah. Above and beyond. That's mate. what I'm here. You can at hit, your, at you your can, service. You can hit me after the podcast. <laughs> all right? Just don't hit me before. There is a lovely sense of changing room coming from Sean. Which, yeah, uh, it's nice. <laughs> a lot of... Lot of uh, Wish I Dove, smell that. Dove, uh, the order done <laughs> now at the minute. <laughs> Shower in a can. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So how's it going? Good, good. Um, getting over a tendon issue at the minute that I had in my quad the last four weeks. So uh, back in two weeks' time, hopefully. And um, yeah, frustrating because I was I was flying until I got that. And uh, um, I, want, I wanted to kind of stay as fit as possible this year. But um, old age and it's always kind of something bigger with me. It's never like a... A small grade, it's, it's more of a tendon issues or something big always happens to me. So um, on the right track though now, thankfully, I'm back in a few weeks. So You've had a bit of a ride with injuries, haven't you? Was it your hip you had a big operation on? Yeah, I had, I had a hip resurfacing the same as um, Andy Murray uh, nearly three years ago now. So it's been brilliant. It's really revolutionised my whole life, to be honest. Regardless of uh, playing rugby, it was something that was bugging me for a long time. Um, wasn't walking properly, wasn't sleeping uh very up and down in my moods and everything because of the pain and um but it's it's been great. It's it's a serious operation. It's um what was the recovery like on that mate? Ten months. Ten months of rehab. Um so it was a big decision was it? Or was it just out you just had to have it? I had to have it. It was the last resort, but I didn't wor I wasn't worrying me never playing again. It was actually yeah. the fact that I was going to be out of pain and be able to walk and yeah. bend down and tie my shoelaces again yeah. Yeah. was what I was looking at. So that's why it was last resort. It was a roll of the dice whether I got back or not. Yeah. And to be the first rugby player ever to come back in that thing is in from that operation is, you know, it's a good, it's a nice achievement for me to have. And when I was doing my rehab, I always thought of that. I always thought, right, you know, ev everyone's saying that I'm mad to do this, <laughs> but I'm properly, I probably am mad to do it, but. Um, it, it worked out brilliantly and how old were you when you had the operation 30 what am i now 34 31 yeah yeah, yeah. just nearly nearly 32 mm -hmm. um but yeah it was it kind of finished off my ireland career it finished off my leinster career because i was struggling i wasn't playing that well the last few games uh, my last game was against wales in the six nations in 2018 i think and i just wasn't uh i wasn't firing on all cylinders at all so it was very frustrating to finish that way but was that your last game for ireland 
Yeah, that was my uh, last game for Ireland. Because when London Irish signed me, they signed me basically, I had to prove my fitness after six months of the signing date, which was the 4th of December 2019. So I was well on their way. I knew at that stage that I'd, I'd be back playing. It was just a matter of biding my time. Um, but they signed me, basically, they took a chance on me, really. Yeah, but yeah. after a couple of months of rehab with them, they knew that I'd be fit to play. So it was it worked out good for them and it worked out good for me. But once you leave Ireland, there's no uh, there's no getting back in there in terms of the national side. Plus, you know, I look at the guys just, nowadays. Just for a lot of listeners, you know, if I'm right, you have to be playing for a, a team in Ireland, don't you, to play for your national side? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that, so is, that is the rule. That's, that's There's no... It's not a written rule. No. It's just a rule within the the, the Irish setup. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, Johnny Sexton was the only one exempt from it when he went to Racing Metro yeah. years upon years ago. Um, but he's he's such a special player for, for them and for, and for us at the time. But yeah, you can't... It's it's kind of... It's, it's, I think in years to come it'll change. Yeah. Because yeah. I think more money's coming into the game. Lads know there's life outside of Ireland, even though the international stuff is very, I suppose it's a massive goal of everyone's as a rugby player within the provinces to, to play with Ireland. Um, but I think if some of the bigger boys end up going in years to come and some of the more serious players for the team, they'll have to change it because uh, we don't have a production line. We have a production line, but we don't have, we don't have a production line like New Zealand would or um, and England where there's that amount of people coming through the system where you could just fill a, fill a role with someone else at the same level. So I think it might change in years to come, but the system works really well at the minute. Yeah. Do you think it'd be good and take the system on for Ireland or not? I think, I see, I think Ireland at the minute are in control of all the players yeah. that they have at their disposal. So they say what games they play. They say what games they play for their provinces, whether it be the, the new URC competition, how many games they play there, how many games they play in Europe. And it's all about making sure that those players are as fresh as possible when it comes to Ireland games. So it's a really good system, obviously. Like speaking to some of the English guys over here, they've they've started to go that way in the last few yeah, years. So yeah, they're, they're they picking and choosing their games now. They're a bit fresher. Yeah. Where before the Premiership used to roll them out every single week. Yeah, comes yeah. to Six Nations, yeah. they're rolled out again. After Six Nations, they're rolled out again. There's no rest for them. It's relentless, isn't it? There yes. was a, there was a similar thing with England with players playing in France who weren't allowed to play for in, uh, for England, wasn't there? One point. Yeah. Whereas now that's not the case. No, that's not the case. So, and it's like, I think everyone is starting to adapt now to understanding that lads have to earn a living, and wherever short window as well to make very that short living. It's not that's ten years anymore, right? No, no, no. You know they've got that short window, and also the the wages. I mean, I mean, it's, it's old. We all know about it, but you know the wages compared to other sports, professional football, tennis, doesn't matter what it is. You know, it, it's nothing like that. So you've got you've got that very short window to make the big bucks if you're a if you're a really good player. Exactly, and then like you, you, this whole thing of like being loyal to one club, they're not. I kind of had the thing about it when I was playing with Leinster. I was very loyal yeah, to Leinster yeah. in Ireland, obviously. But then when you get outside that bubble and you look back in, you're kind of saying to yourself, well. No one's ever spoken to you since no. you, f you finished your last game. No one's ever sent you a letter saying, thanks for your services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's your body? Do you need yeah, anything yeah, yeah. done? So, like, no one does any of that. So, it's, it's, it's you're like a piece of meat. It's the industry we're in. Yeah. Like, you're like a piece of meat while, while they can use you, they will. Yeah. And if you're broken, well, they, they'll just use someone else. Yeah, yeah. It's a professional business. And, professional and, and business, from their exactly. side, it's just like any normal business, not yeah. not sport. It's You've pretty got a, ruthless. Like. You, yeah, it will be. Yeah. So, rugby side, obviously, this is our Rob and I's new podcast. The aim is to get some... You're our virgin you're our, celebrity. Yeah, you're our test. <laughs> so, so you're about as well, A-list... this going to be going You're about as A-list as, as currently <laughs> as, yeah, as This might get. be the last one as well, in fairness. <laughs> the first and last podcast. Um, you know, we're trying to talk a bit about shooting, uh, get people involved that might be a well-known, um, you know, and obviously ambassadors of... Our our company's Tweedland EJ Churchills, and I know you're quite an ambassador for EJ's at the mm. minute. Um, for Tweedle, he pays us. <laughs> <laughs> he pays us a lot of money to be an ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, for Tweedle, no. That's why I've invited you shooting. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've got you've got that other. You've got his great mate, haven't you? Haskell as one that's of your it, ambassadors. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. fellow who never shoots, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The fellow who never shoots. We he we did a charity <laughs> shooting event and Haskell came. He was part of it. He was so bad. It was hilarious. <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah, yeah. We were laughing. I know him really well, and 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 he and he loves his shooting. He just doesn't do anything now. No. I mean, it's all about practice, like with any sport. Yeah. No, but he was. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was quite funny. 
Um, so, yeah, mate, what would be nice to know is where your shooting journey began. I know you had a background of farming, maybe yeah. talk us through that and a bit of poaching around the farm, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. I suppose it all started through my dad. Um, like, I, I remember when I was like four or five years of age, still walking into the like bathroom at night time, like in the middle of the night going for a pee and next thing you'd see like five or six salmon in the bath. So he'd have to, he'd, have, he'd, he'd me out after poaching the salmon, like. But that's the way. At 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 the at the time, he I think they I think he used to get thirteen pounds a salmon at that stage. Thirteen pounds Irish punts, and that was a huge amount of money back then. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing was, uh, before I was born, there was a bounty on foxes in Ireland. Right. So, yeah. So he used to be out the whole time after foxes as well, and he actually had a pack of. Beagles, even when I was growing up, I used to hunt the beagles the whole time with him until I was like 15, 16. Um, so you'd get like a ten or a fox or something? Yeah, I think I think it was a little bit more for a fox. Is it a tail? You hand, hand in the tail? No, then? it was a whole fox. Oh, right. Yeah, you hand in the whole fox. So I think they used to properly skin him then, like that stage. So it was like different times to now, obviously. But yeah, yeah. I think that's where it all started for me. And as soon as I was old enough, I suppose, to uh, get out and about with him and walk the land and go shooting, I was shooting. And I, I still remember most evenings it would be, um, it could be a venison stew, it could be a rabbit stew, it could be, um, it could be pheasants, it could be pigeon. Yeah. Uh, we ate an awful amount of food. Like, and Dad used to just shoot the whole time. Like, it wasn't the case brilliant, of... Brilliant, isn't it? It's brilliant, yeah. It was, and that's that's where I got what the love way, of it from. What a that's way why, that's why you're like a that. tank. Yeah, as well. <laughs> All that protein. All the protein, yeah. yeah. But it, was, it definitely came from there, and it's, it's a thing that I suppose I've enjoyed a lot. Um... My whole life, I find I find shooting and hunting completely different. Yeah, I like shooting. Clay shooting for me is something I enjoy. It's a switch off from rugby. It's a switch off from everyday life. It's I'm completely relaxed. I'm thinking of nothing else while I'm shooting, and I think that's what I get a kick out. Of. Even though it frustrates me sometimes because I mightn't shoot that well, but yeah. there's other <laughs> days I've great days and. I really enjoy it, even though I mightn't be scoring that highest and, rank. But and probably the challenge it. as well of a new sport, is it, mate? I mean, you're obviously very competitive. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the nice thing we've always said about clay shooting is it's a numbers game, isn't it? You know, you know when you've shot well, you know when you haven't shot well. You know, yeah. you, you know if you've you only if you need that get, one target. You probably want to get over eighty out of a hundred or something. You're happy. If you're not, you're disappointed. You know, it's a real mathematical game. It is, and uh, it, it's. It, I suppose if you're going at it professionally or trying to get really good at it. You have to put shells through the gun. You have to have a process. It's it revert, for me anyway. It reverts back to sport again. Yeah. It's like a goal kicker or process over and over again. But I suppose for me shooting, I'm like, oh, I don't really want to. I don't really want to concentrate that much. I want to have a bit of crack. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. do want to get better at it, obviously, because I'm competitive. But yeah. I'd need to be shooting an awful lot more if I try to get to Churchill's uh every week it probably doesn't happen for me i'd love to go every week i'd probably love to go twice a week but you, you're still training yeah but just time wise and then your body and how you're feeling after training you've got to have your head on the game as well haven't you for shooting yeah I, you, I, you know I, people who turn up and oh i'm tired or whatever yeah. it just doesn't it just doesn't work yeah i've went i've went a few times to those registered shoots there and i have like i've been wrecked i've been rushing from training to the shoot to get there on time i get there i mightn't have eaten then yeah. you're halfway around the course and you're like, I'm starving here, I'm tired. Not concentrating. You're not concentrating, your head's not in the game. And next minute you end up... And then you take to Instagram saying, how oh, shit, you'd shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm blaming, exactly. blaming me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah blaming blaming my fault. Blaming Rob. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. The, the targets were rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. But then on, in hunting, on the other hand, then is, I think it's a very, I think it's a thing that's um, unexplained in a lot of cases. Absolutely. Of, yeah. how, of how people like... Um, what it's all about, how you started in it, because for me it was survival when we were chaps and our whole family, I'm one of five at home, five kids, we all ate what dad shot. Yeah. And like, like did it did us no harm whatsoever, but yeah. also I like, I like doing that. I don't like going out and um, to a massacre or shooting loads of stuff every year, but like for deer and pheasant and stuff, I might shoot a dozen pheasant rough shooting at home in the whole season if I was at home I might shoot three or four deer usually them are for farmers neighbours uh, get them get them processed properly um, so like it's small it's small things like that but I enjoy that whole process of it too and then obviously you're having the freshest meat literally yeah 
the freshest of everything, yeah. really, you know. So it's, it's organic as well, isn't yeah. it? In its own way. It's a very special feeling as well. And, um, you know, that, that feeling you'll have had with a kid going out with your dad, that hunter gatherer type feeling, using your instincts against the animal. It, that never, I, I always find that never leaves you. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough now with work to go and experience a lot of driven shoots. But what I always love most is, you, you know, the flighting, um, you know, or some pigeon decoying over some mm. over some stubble because you 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 know it's your instinct against nature and and you know stalking gives you that as well isn't yeah. it and it's yeah. Yeah. um i think a lot of like you say a lot of people do not understand that um also the people i just love the people i love talking to yeah, all the beaters course. and everybody out there as well it's just a, it's amazing isn't it the amount of all the different people that it brings together to make a day is is quite remarkable. Yeah, and they're the ones that make it, I think, as well. That those yeah. people, it's easy to be standing behind a gun shooting away. It's yeah. the rest. It's the process of the whole day. It's massive. Like, um, it's huge. And when, they're all local people. And you know, you we look at it, and we don't want to get too deep on this very first episode. But it's um, no. you know, <laughs> you, if you start to about the banning, you know, of shooting and everything else, you just think the lives it's going to affect, especially in those rural areas. You know, it's just unbelievable, and nobody has a clue how. No. deep that's going to go and I, I that's a good point rob i think as well people that live in the city or that aren't involved in the countryside in general don't really know what goes on out there no like if, if i brought someone down to tolo for instance let's say i brought some of my friends from leinster years ago down to tolo and we went shooting pigeons one evening at a wood. is that where you're from yeah tolo, yeah. tolo in county carlo the boys afterwards was like I never knew. I never knew we, you'd done any of this. Like I never knew how good this was or enjoyable it was, or how like they were out for half the day in the fresh air with me, and we're just wandering around with the springers. We, we give the boys a shotgun each, taught them how to shoot safely, and all that crack. That would be interesting. But they had, yeah, <laughs> but they had a great time. But if you asked them before that, before they actually experienced something like that, they probably did. Did laugh? They no, haven't a clue. No, no. Yeah. So I think that I think the education part of it actually for. For people who are against like hunting, for people who are against shooting, um, they need to come out and see how these people, how people from the countryside live their lives, how people uh, make a living off this, and have done for centuries now. Yeah, where yeah, and require and not just make a living, require it for a living. Exactly. You know, you look at people. Look, go to North Yorkshire up into the Dales. People are going beating all the time. You know, they're sometimes beating three, four, five times yeah. a day. Yeah, uh, a week. You, you know, it, it, Helmsley Square oh in Yorkshire. God. You know, on a Wednesday morning, it and is. the, the and square I, and is think, full of people I, in tweets. And I you think know, and you've hit on it. It is education, and we've got to we've got to get better at that. Yeah. The problem is, some people just don't want to be educated, do they? They've got their views, and and that's it. And I think that's a great shame in life. Yeah, I think there's a lot. There is people out there trying to, I suppose, get the word out there now and and give a little bit more info around um, shooting and hunting. But it does need to be on a broader scale. And I think you know you have um, Serene Bottom. He he's, yeah, he's he, brilliant. He he's brilliant. He speaks out a lot yeah. about it. Um, probably even for me, like I could speak out a little bit more about it. It's it's difficult when you're playing because of the amount of abuse you would get. I know. Still off to certain yeah. people, but. I don't really mind that side of things because I've grew up with it, yeah. so I understand. It. So I, I'm in. I'm happy. Yeah, you're with, happy with what you're I'm doing. Happy with what what I'm happy what I'm doing. Yeah. Um. If yeah. they want to challenge me on that or talk to me about it in a in a reasonable manner, well, great. Yeah. Come and I'll show you even. Um. But not too many people will actually take you up on that no. offer when you challenge it. And it's hard, isn't it? And that mm. you know, listening to an, another podcast the other day about you know um, social media and everything else the problem is by talking out you really put your head on a stick don't you and and then you get absolutely yeah. hammered <laughs> and beaten on social media by people yeah. left right Trial and by social media yeah, yeah 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 it's horrendous saying that though and not to be gloomy I, I do think our shooting industry as a whole um i know a lot of people don't understand it i do think a lot of people more and more especially do and um it's not all doom and gloom. I genuinely don't think so. But I, um, I agree with you there, and I think sometimes we can, we sort of, you know, I know what we're doing. A lot of people don't agree with, but you know, actually, it is a brilliant sport, and the sport is on a is on a high. You yeah. know, the amount of people doing it, and I'm talking the sport is in clay pigeon shooting, not just gang shooting, but you know, the whole sport in whole. The you know, the number of people applying for shotgun certificates is going through the yeah. roof. The number of people joining us as members and other and all our friends and competitors out there, they're all the same. They're all flat out. The number of people going clay pigeon shooting, you know, 
It's um, the number of people wanting to do the sport is massive. It is absolutely on a high. It's just as you said. It's brilliant. You, people can turn up. You can go out with somebody. They can have a go. You know, it's not hard to start with, and and you can do it and take an hour and go, can't you? It doesn't take too long. No. It can be done in a certain timeline, and I think sometimes that's where it wins over something like golf, for example. It just takes so long to play a round of golf, doesn't it? And and I find people are very much time poor at the moment. And uh, they want to be able to do it like you. You want to come up. You know, you've got an hour. You can get to us in an hour. You can shoot for an hour and a half, whatever you want to shoot, and then go. Yeah. You know, and you can fill that desire or that need for some shooting within that period, can't you? And I think that whole, the I suppose, how shooting evolves over the next while, I think is going to be interesting because you can go for the hour or two if you want, but the whole day experience then as well, whether it be, you know, nice music and evenings or a lunch or a dinner after good shooting. Or... Sam and I are good at lunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll do that on episode two. Yeah, that's yeah. the side of it as well, which is highly entertaining. If you have a half a day yeah. or if you have a corporate day or whatever you may yeah. have, because that that makes it all, all the better. You have a bit of shooting, you have a bit of crack, you have good music, you have great people around you. And then, like, it's that's, that's I suppose, that's your little community. Um, that you're that you used to going we, to and enjoying. We were talking about the world championships, weren't we, with us? Yeah, just this before. Year, yeah. How much fun that was, and just the music and everything. It was just brilliant. It was just there was such an atmosphere there. It was just fantastic. Yeah, it was great. It was great. I had a few too many points the last day, but oh, I yeah, enjoyed it. I'm glad you brought that. I saw you. I saw you bumped into you just what? as you were leaving, didn't you? I? I was like, <laughs> he's had a pint <laughs> or ten. Yeah. Um, I'd say I did have ten. I think. Um, now, what's this? Football, basketball, before rugby. Football, basketball, before rugby. I don't know. He wrote Is that notes. right? You did you, before you started playing rugby as you were oh, young. Gaelic, Gaelic football, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the the GEA at home where I suppose everyone that watches it over here on Sky Sports um over the last few years thinks it's absolutely crazy sport. But that was probably I was better at better at that than I was at rugby for sure. Um but when I got to sixteen I was like, right, what am I going to do? What am I where's my career going here? Yeah. And Gaelic football at home is an amateur sport, even though I have friends play county football at home. Um, they're more they do more training than any professional. They, well, work, they just don't get paid. Yeah, they don't get paid, but they right. work nine to five jobs. But they're like in the gym at six six o'clock, wow. training in the evening. Like this could be four evenings a week. Wow. Um, so they do as much training as us, um, if not more. But the, I I love the whole that whole thing at home. The Gaelic football scene is where you're from, the community, the heart of everything, the heartbeat of everything. If we didn't have Gaelic football in Ireland or soccer for that matter it was just like um, a rugby nation would be would be absolutely incredible yeah because the amount just of like athletes, New Zealand is yeah, in a way yeah the amount of athletes that are actually playing Gaelic football and hurling over there is phenomenal like. is it right so is rugby not the number one sport in Ireland oh no no, no? That's the, what... rugby is the only professional sport really and, and soccer obviously but um, Gaelic football has the most participants and, and it's hurling, not professional and it's not professional or never will be professional because to finance that game, even in Ireland, would be I'd, you have crazy numbers. Like, because you have thirty-two counties, which is a county team. Within those counties, you have club teams, and some of those counties have like twenty club teams. So, wow. so you can only have the counties as professional setups. But how would you fund thirty-two of them and give them all the same money? And mm. and you know what I mean? You can't. You don't transfer from one. You, if I, I'm from Carlow and you were from Dublin, for instance. I wouldn't leave Carlow to go to Dublin, or a Dublin player wouldn't leave Dublin to go to Carlow right. if he was eligible, let's say. Yeah, yeah. You'd stay in Dublin. Now, you Dublin has... Play like, for your county. Yeah, you play for your county, and that is it. And right. you play for your club within oh, that brilliant. county, and that's it too. Like, there's no... There so is you, people that transfer from clubs, Yeah. but they're like... The people go after them then. They're like, oh, he's he's after leaving our community. He's gone to the neighbouring one or whatever. <laughs> like, watch out, like, the next time you play. So Gaelic football is huge at home. Huge, huge, So huge. at school and stuff, that's what you'd play over rugby. That's what they'd teach you. Almost. Yeah. When I was in fifth year, which is the equivalent of uh, doing your um, A-levels over here, yeah, GCSEs, yeah. Um, that's the first rugby team we had in our school. And it was like in a, it was like a C league, for instance, or B league, I think, at the time. And we actually won it that year. Because we'd be about 16, 15? Yeah, 15, yeah, 16 probably. 15, 16. So that's the first time you played rugby? No, I played oh. rugby in the local rugby club in Tullow. Yeah, yeah. Since I was nine or ten. Oh, right. But it wouldn't that have been... That makes me feel a bit better. Yeah. I started when I was five and look at <laughs> look at my rugby career as opposed to Sean's. <laughs> but it was... Uh, this could be very short if we're going to talk about yeah. rugby career. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so the club at home would have been a very, very small rural club, very sociable club. Um, 
great fun, great people involved, and it still is, um, and supported me throughout my whole career. But I started there when I was nine, um, and then when we got to school at that level, we, we had that team, that core group of lads in the school anyway. So when we started that team in fifth year, we won that year, lost the following year in our leaving search year. But um, we had a lot of good rugby players in our actuals in that area at the time. Yeah. Um, and some of them could have went on. It's a very hard area to get picked out. That's the problem within Leinster because it's not a it's not a, a private school. Right. It's a public school. So you, there's two systems in Ireland. There's a school system, which is all the majority Dublin, a little bit of Kildare. The majority private schools, no doubt. Private school, yeah, all yeah. private schools. And then the other system is the youth system, which is basically everyone else in the, in, in the province, in Leinster as a province, which is a massive amount of people. And that's where I actually came out of. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's a different pathway to what happens over here, and it's a different pathway where the majority of rugby players in Ireland come from school systems yeah. within Leinster, Munster, Connacht and Ulster. Yeah, I mean... You'd probably find a similar trend in England, maybe more, not not as much now, but certainly back in the day. Like, if you weren't a private school, you know, in and in playing for one of the top schools, you'd not look. You know, no, a, a lot of, at, a, lot of compre- a lot of comprehensive schools didn't play it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, mm. soccer, football, yeah. it's all about football and cricket. Yeah. That's the thing over here. There's so many people playing so many different sports. It's, yeah. You know, there's going to be people slip through the net. And, and talk to us about that. So you've come over here. What are, what are the differences? I mean, are you enjoying being over here? It's probably a bigger pool for you, isn't it? And yeah, it's. I, I, I like the lifestyle. London, living in London. And, yeah. yeah. I like the lifestyle a lot. Dublin, when I look at it now, I was in such a bubble and such a. I was such so caught up with the Leinster setup and all that area. It was, it's very actually pressurised for people, I think. And looking, when I went back even last weekend or two weekends ago for the New Zealand game. What same a game, people, by the way. What a game. Oh, Jeez. Same people Amazing. in the same places, in the same like bars and stuff. Yeah. And I hadn't been there for two and a half years, three yeah. years. Yeah, and I suppose and they, being a Lens player and an Irish player living there. all know you. You go out for a bit, you're being hounded. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit different. So over here, nobody knows you. Yeah. Nobody cares about you either, which is lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're left to your own devices. Yeah. Um, the differences in rugby, I suppose, is the Irish system or Leinster system has this phenomenal high standard that has been there now for 10, 12 years since we started, let's say, a group of us. And um, We say Leinster is the equivalent of Saracens in this country. 100%, yeah. 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 They're just the standard bearers, for instance, Yeah, in everything to do. And the difference is that in London Irish at the minute, we're trying to build that. Yeah. So it's not built yet, and there's a long, long, long way to go. Yeah. Well, we've, we've set a few little bits of foundations in place, but it's it's a process. Like Leinster, when I went into Leinster in 07, um, we let, literally didn't, when did we win the first one? 09, so two years later. But we had a very special group of players that had been around a long time. Where London Irish has a very relatively new squad, young squad, and, and some experienced players coming now. Yeah. So the contrasts are very different, and it's very hard to to just rock on without taking a few steps too many. And, and are you helping them in that, that journey with your experience? Yeah, I am. I am. It's um, it's about getting everyone on the one page, though. And we've so many, we've a lot of Aussies, Kiwis, uh, yeah. Samoans. We're, we're a very mixed team. Um, so it's very hard to, to the thing about Leinster is, they're all from Leinster. Yeah. So we're all we're we all so know what's together as a unit already. Yeah, so we're already there. Yeah. But the thing with coming into a different team like this, where there's so many, you have to find what works for everyone. Yeah, of course. And and some things that you might think would be great might necessarily be great for five or six other lads. So you you kind of pull that strip it back a little bit, and and you know drift feed it over a period of time the way to get used to a certain a standard. But we're getting there, and we're like we're playing some brilliantly exciting rugby. We haven't got to, we've only won one game. Mm-hmm. in the Prem but we've drawn three last four like we're whiskers away from getting it right yeah. um, and if we get some of that uh, stuff right during the week our discipline stuff um, you know we'll be it in a great place. much to turn it will it no it won't and that's the thing you just have to be patient and not panic yeah. and yeah. not try and change things too quickly like small things small things little and often yeah. might do it for us yeah, so could, yeah. um, that whole process has been learning for me too because I, I, I know what good looks like. Yeah. And it's trying to get so us to get there. To, to get there. Um, and I also, I was in Leinster when we weren't going so well, so I know what bad looks like too. Yeah. 
So it's good to have that experience, but it's also it's it's frustrating when you know we've so much potential and you want to get there in you don't want to get there straight away. But we've been at it now for two years, yeah, yeah, and we're we're banging on doors and we're nearly there. So if we push on now in this next block, we could be in a great place come the end of the season. And is this experience something you're going to turn into a career? Maybe when you stop playing, or are you thinking of doing other things? What what is the plan for? Yeah, I think I'm going to coach. Are you? I think I'm going to coach a uh, shooting coach. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a job. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm probably going to go down the coaching route. I think um, Sean Bramley, watch out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look out, Sean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you with Sean? Bra- yeah, you're with Sean. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just a slightly the different one. Sean. Yeah, he's on. A, he's on a diet. Um, <laughs> or he's been on a diet. When yeah, you walk yeah. out. Um, yeah, I'm going to go down the coaching route. It's probably a natural fit for me. I really get a good kick out of it. Um, I've coached since I was 18 at home. Um, still coaching now coaching Roslyn Park uh, coaching the Wild Geese in London Irish a little bit every now and again probably give them more time over the coming weeks um, so yeah it's just I, I enjoy it I yeah, enjoy yeah. See, I enjoy a plan when, a, when you give someone a plan or give a team a plan and it works out and lads implement that properly and you win games it's it's very satisfying feeling so yeah, I can imagine. whether that be here or whether it be back home I'm not sure um, but You've got so much to give here. though haven't you to the sport it must be nice to 100%. have that it must be nice to have that opportunity and being able to pass that on to other people as well coming behind you and, and, and give your experience to them it's a great yeah no it is it is good that way it's I suppose maybe some people don't think I'm, I'm, I'm that approachable at times because I'm very strong in, in my ways and, and the way I like things done myself. But you, some of the younger guys are like asking me a lot of questions and can you sit down with me, watch a video, can you do this, can you do that and have a look at a few clips with them. So it is good to see them boys starting to kind of uh, draw a little bit of information out, which yeah. I'm w- more than happy to. I, yeah, I, yeah. I want to see these younger guys that are in our club do really, really well and yeah. become England players. Yeah. Not just become good run Irish players, just become England players. Do you so, see a lot of yourself in these younger players coming through? I mean, they're, uh, they're a different world now for them compared to when you were 17, 18, 19. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny because when they're in a setup for a period of time and maybe they're, they haven't got... Um, people haven't been under case too much. They get very comfortable. And then when someone comes in and gives them a rattle or rattles the setup a little bit, they don't really know what's going on. So I think I think in London Irish probably that's happened over the past five, six years. I think people have been very comfortable. Younger guys in the academies have been very comfortable. Are they are they trying to be the best uh farmer themselves? Maybe not. Are they now? Yes. Definitely lads have really like up the level. But that comes from the training that we do at such an intense level now compared to what it was when we first came in, all of us. I was going to say, I think guys. you've had a taste of that. You? What, was, what was that about you having full Englishes before a, before a match day before, back oh, in the day? There was, oh, I had... <laughs> like, sounds, more, sounds perfect. A yeah, couple of hours before a game. Exactly. I used to have a... Bre- See, that was the thing with club rugby back home. You train Tuesday, Thursday, play a match on a Saturday. Yeah. I used to have a breakfast roll like at 10 o'clock. We could be playing at 12. <laughs> like black pudding, white pudding, red sauce all over my face and all the game. <laughs> Um, so like the, the whole thing has changed now. But I want yeah. lads to understand that if they if they create habits, younger guys more so, if they create habits now when they're like nineteen, twenty, twenty one, they're there forever more. And then you just build on those as you go through yeah. your career. Yeah. But if you're trying to build habits when you're twenty four, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, you're like you're not going to get to where you want to get to by the time you're thirty, for instance. Uh, let's say an international player, the best lads who are international players are disciplined from a young age. Yeah and have all the credentials to be an international player already. Maybe it mightn't happen for some lads, but yeah. at least they're, they've done everything in their power to be in a position to maybe get picked. Well, I mean, you look at England this weekend, you've got uh, Rafi Quirk, 20 years old, Marcus Smith, yeah. you know, 21. There's it's, a l- lovely, like, it's lovely seeing them, isn't yeah. it? No, oh, so they're, it's they're, brilliant. See, they're, they're going to revolutionise England a little bit, I think, in the next two years leading yeah. into the World Cup. These younger guys, they play with no fear, mm. They're very, very good at what they do, obviously. They're full very talented, full of confidence. And they'll they'll put their own stamp on the game a little bit. And I think yeah. that's what we've seen yeah. with England over the Autumn Internationals, the last two games especially. Yeah. So it's exciting. It's exciting. I suppose we'll probably fast forward it a bit and like, you know, the reasons behind all this advice from Sean. You've done two tours with like with the Lions. Mm. Fifty six caps with Ireland, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, arguably scored the best Lions try in history or finished it. Yeah. At least <laughs> <Scored it. Yeah. laughs> against New Zealand, it's 100 meters. If anyone asks, <laughs> right. 
I watched the video this morning and I can just see your black scrum hat behind. I remember watching it live. Head down. As fast as you possibly can run, yeah. head down, yeah. and it just all paid off, didn't it? Yeah, no, it was great. The, the two tours were incredible experiences. Um, the crack we had on both of them, the people you meet, the players, everything was brilliant. Um, and very lucky and honoured to, to be in those positions, um, especially on two tours. So, oh, I loved I loved every minute of playing with the Lions. Um, it's a very unique thing. It's very special. Um, Pinnacle? Definitely pinnacle, yeah. 100%. I think, you know, as a, as a youngster growing up watching international rugby, like whenever the Lions come round, yeah. I always remember watching it, like yeah. every bit of it I could possibly see, the behind the scenes bit, everything, and it's just... Have to, you ever been a watched one? No, mate, no. I went out to, the, uh, I went out to New Zealand in 2005 Did you? to watch it, where we got drummed, if you remember. It was, drummed, a, tough, yeah. it was a tough tour, but the atmosphere... It's yeah. just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. literally, this is in New Zealand, and the, I mean, there's just red shirts everywhere. It everywhere. was yeah. brilliant. Camper yeah. vans, like thirty thousand camper vans. We were in a camper van, six of us, all our size, in a camper van. It was rather, <laughs> it was rather uh, cozy. Yeah, I can and, imagine. Uh, you can imagine. But it is the it, honestly, I'd recommend it to anybody, and and not just not just lads as well. You know, it's uh, people go out, families go out, yeah. take your wives out. It's it's just brilliant. Absolutely, my, 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 a wonderful my, experience. My sister and her family. Husband and the two kids went out in 2017, uh, and my younger sister and younger brother as well. They went out and just got a camper van and travelled the whole of New Zealand. Wow! So it was it was it was, um, it was brilliant for them as well. Brilliant. Did you ever get any downtime on tours, even with islands, and go and do a bit of shooting anywhere? Or I did. I, I went yeah. to New Zealand. I went um, I went to Doctari for sa safaris was named it in uh, where was it again? Otago near Otago somewhere. Yeah. Um, we went up there, shot a fallow and a couple of pigs. Nice. Um, which was good fun for the day. Um, had to drag them off the mountain ourselves on our back and stuff. They hunt differently over there. Like it's just shorts. Like it was, I, I, it wasn't really that warm of a day. But no. like they're all in shorts and t-shirts and. It's winter out there, isn't it? Rifle like <laughs> that's <laughs> filthy dirty. Yeah. Like the they, rifle. <laughs> like they don't they don't put any. Um, Oil. <laughs> don't put anything on any of the guns. No. Like the scopes are like the basics are basic. So it's it's funny that they don't see a need for a, a Swarovski Z Z eight I or anything on a on a gun. Like they just basic scope, make sure it's accurate, pull the trigger, bang. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's hilarious. They fire them into the back of the Jeep like. Um, <laughs> so it was funny to watch all this while while I was there, but it was great was to that get out for sure. So? Yeah. Who yeah. who any teammates went who with else, you? Who else did come with me? Yeah, who actually came that day? Would you believe? Must have been fun. Oh, Pete, Pete, my man, he came. Oh yeah, he likes his shooting. Yeah, he likes. He? Well, he does. He hasn't done much of it recently yeah. because I was actually talking to him yesterday. But yeah, he came and one other came. What about Rory Best? Was it? He likes his shooting. Rory he came has on his that own. Day, yeah, he has he? his own driven shoe. Yeah, um, at his own farm. He's a lovely home. guy. Yeah, lovely guy, Rory. Um, they they run a lovely little shoot back back Good home in their place. Yeah, he's a serious man to drink. <laughs> yeah. I remember you telling me that. You want to be in the holier help now to, to stay with him for the two days or whatever. <laughs> he, he would stay going for two days, if not three. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's tough work keeping up with him. And you were talking about, I remember ages ago chatting with you, and, and we were talking about uh, when you finish rugby career, doing something really silly like sort of boxing or cage fighting or something like that. Was that? Was there any? Yeah, I was. Uh, I wouldn't do cage fighting, but I would, I would box... Um, I've done a little bit of it recently. I've done a little bit when I was younger. Um, I was actually, I sparred a couple of weeks ago, properly sparred a few weeks ago when I went back to Dublin. Um, and that was a big eye-opener as such. Mm. Um, it's different when there's someone who knows what they're doing and they're firing a few shots at you and catching you. It's amazing. So it teaches you a lot yeah. very quickly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I don't know, I, I like the challenge of a new sport like that. Um, while, it's, while it's very tough, obviously, and it's very individual, can't do much of it at the minute. I do it probably once a week for a bit of conditioning, but yeah. I think it's a phenomenal sport. I think anyone that gets into the ring, you need a lot of respect for them. Um, going in there and getting punished like yeah. they do, but yeah, it could be something I I might. Uh, the fitness dander is in afterwards. The, the fitness is amazing, isn't it? Those boys. I did a white collar boxing fight in uh, twenty fifteen. Yeah. Believe it or that. not, yeah. yeah. And um, and we train. I mean, absolutely, just flat out for. I did it for the Bobby Moore Fund for um, prostate cancer. Bowel cancer, sorry, and uh, it was a magical time. Just every night, so we trained at this stable in Maidenhead with a wonderful guy called Roman Greenberg. He was ranked like five heavyweight in the world at that point, and he was a monster of a man. 
and um, and he gave up his time. And this whole stable where we had a guy called Jim Evans was the trainer, very famous trainer in rugby and um, in boxing. And they all just donated their time for charity. And we'd go seven thirty on an evening till nine thirty. We did five nights a week, and then played rugby on the Saturday. Broke, had rest yeah. on Sunday, and then back seven thirty that night. It was exhausting. I remember for the first five nights, I was sick with exhaustion every single <laughs> night. Yeah. They'd wear you in, wear you out afterwards. It was just immense. It was a brilliant time. And then it's just that that focus, knowing that at the end of three months, you're going to be getting in a ring you know, on your own. There's only you. Yeah. There was, you know, we did it at the Grosvenor in uh, Park Lane, Hilton, it was. And there was sort of a thousand people there. We raised £100,000 for charity. Wow. I've never, brilliant. so many people just wanted to pay for me did to get in the ring. Did you bring home the win? Did you win the fight? Well, yeah. this is the funny thing about it, right? Yeah. I might show you the DVD at some point. I knocked him down in the third round. But on the replay, it does look like a trip. <laughs> <All right>. you <laughs> know, so, so you we, tripped him. Yes, yeah, so I tripped him. Yeah, yeah. But in the but yeah. So there you go. And that Fair was enough. it. Really. We raised hundred grand for charity. It was it was <clears> fantastic. <throat> but it is a it's an amazing sport, and I met some brilliant people mm. from all walks of life. But just there's this one united spirit that you know the fact that if you're going to go and do that, no matter who you are, they'll support you to they'll do support it. You, yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. There's one thing for sure. If I was ever to take up boxing, I'd rather. Uh, fight oh, Rob yeah, and yeah, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you. Can I just say the feelings mutual? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would not like to get in the uh, ring with you. Oh, fantastic, mate. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, we're sort of getting to the end of it, but we've covered your life after rugby. What are you, <coughs> your shooting goals? If you've got any shooting goals, you know, would you like to compete a bit more? Um, yeah, I, I think I probably would a little bit um, when I'm when I'm finished playing. Yeah, um, get my head into it maybe for a good a good year and see um see where I can get to because I just personally I'd like to see where I could get to. Yeah. Um, I got so what did I get the last day? I think I won bronze actually in my class the yeah. last day. That was the first time I've ever got anything. Um, so I was happy enough actually the last day, even though I, I shot very badly on two stands. But um, the competition is getting so much harder as well, isn't? It? So many more people doing it. So and, many more. And some people with quite a bit of time and money so they yeah. become good and it's amazing seeing some people they've got time and money how they become good so quick yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. remarkable i mean it is you know suddenly they've started and then six months down the line they're shooting we've got a guy um who puts a lot he puts loads of time into it he's shooting like 84 85 in the, after one year of shooting yeah, he's yeah. never shot ever yeah. it's amazing martin it? martin yeah. yeah you know and he's and yeah. he just he loves it and um, you know, so, and, he, uh, and, he's, and he's but he's put the time into it. Like that's anything. the thing. It's like anything. It's practice, yeah. practice, practice. Shells yeah, yeah. should have gone. Um, What's your highest score out of hundred? Eighty-six, I think. Seven. Man, that's awesome. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, eighty-six, eighty-six, yeah. eighty-seven. Yeah. And, uh, um, but I'd lo like then. Then when you look at that score. You look at the score the last day. I finished on it. Whatever it was seventy-nine. It was a low scoring day for everyone. But I dropped like seven birds on one sand. And then yeah. you're thinking, oh Jesus, like if I get <laughs> if I get half of them right, yeah. where does it bring you down? Or you yeah. drop a yeah. stupid bird here and there. So I think that's the fun of it, isn't it? Yeah, and it's then it's repetition as well. Like Sean Ramley is brilliant with me because I, I he he like he has a stick, he carries a stick with him and he's with me, like the the one for picking up the catches. And if I'm doing not if I don't keep my head in the stock or I'm not <laughs> doing what he tells me, I get a poke in the back straight away. So um, shooting the yeah. tips of our good yeah. top shooting in the <laughs> shooting coach there. You're you know? really selling that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lessons with Sean. Come for come for a lesson at church with Sean and get whacked with a yeah, stick if you don't do as he tells. Yeah. Yeah. But no, he's he's brilliant to be fair. He keeps he keeps that. He's such me a great guy. He's he such a great guy and he's a brilliant shot as well. So yeah. he's beautiful to Nice watch. to have him there. Yeah, he's a good yeah. man to have on your shoulder. I must admit, I take an odd sneaky lesson with him as well. He is, uh, he's fantastic. He really is. Well, listen, mate, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, You're very well. No, You're very well. Really appreciate it. Best of luck with the new podcast. Yes, yeah, well, yeah. we'll see how it goes, yeah. won't we? Episode one complete. Yeah. At least the three of us will listen to this one. That's three. Yeah, exactly, that's three yeah. listens. Yeah, yeah. my mum might. My mum yeah. will probably listen. He's got to a it. big family. He'll yeah. get in all his yeah. sister. Yeah. He didn't even talk about your sister. She's an amazing sports lady, isn't she? Yeah, she's good. Yeah, Alex plays. Alex plays rugby as well. Yeah, they all. All of my family have played a good, good level. Um, yeah. yeah, my two brothers play well rugby. They're they're pretty handy. And Caroline, my eldest sister, she was very good at Gaelic football. Played a little bit of rugby, but she was getting a bit old at that stage. But Alex is a very good sports person. Yeah, yeah she can play everything. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. Well, listen, thank you very much for at last minute coming to see us. And 
Okay, welcome. I promise to get it organised better <laughs> next time. <all> right? <laughs> so that rounds up another episode of the Twiddle Podcast. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you are watching on YouTube or Spotify, please like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Our goal is to get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube before the end of July. So there's plenty of you watching it that aren't subscribed. Just click the button for us. Do us a favour. Don't cost you anything. And um, yeah. Right now on Twitter.com, you can win £10,000 to spend with EJ Churchill's on either clays, cartridges, guns, clothing, you name it, sandwiches, even caviar in the caviar prunier bar. Um, so yeah, grab a ticket. They're just £20. Click the link in the bio, support us, and uh, can't wait to see you all on the next episode. <laughs>